Thank you, everybody who's come along tonight. Um, as Wesley has said, the last week, the 10 days have been very tough for us as an organization, um, very tough for us personally. Um, it's taken us away from our families. It's uh, caused our families concern um, when, when they see us, see us so stressed and, and so distracted. Um, and we have been accused of, of many things this week. We have been accused of being pro-abortion. We've been accused of being discriminatory against disabled people. We've been accused of <clears throat> breaking the 11th commandment of the evangelical church, which is be kind. Um, but we have to speak the truth. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who is a famous abolitionist who brought an end to slavery in America, said, I will be as harsh as truth and un uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. And the words of men and women who are, were faithful warriors for Christ in the past have been on our minds and on our hearts this week. And if any of you saw the update the other night, um, I wanted to make something very clear at the start of it. And I want to make that very clear again. This is not about Paul Given. This is not about him. This is not an attack on him. This is not an attack on the DUP. It's not an attack on any of our pro-life leaders. We appreciate people who are willing to take a stand for life, who are willing to step out and do something. But the problem is that what he is doing is secular, that what he is doing has been tried before, and what he is doing is ultimately going to lead to failure. And I want to take a little bit of an opportunity tonight to unpack some of that. <clears throat> and I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious of, of how long I took last week. And, and we want to leave some time for questions and answers, but we, we, there's a lot here to get through and a lot here to unpack. And if we need to, um, we can revisit it again. Um, so I want to start out tonight with just a little bit of an overview of what has been happening um, in Northern Ireland over the, the course of, of the last year to the 16 months. Um, and hopefully you can see my, um, my screen here. So, um, one of the things that we're conscious of is that we we embed our whole lives in this. We we go to bed thinking about this. We we wake up thinking about this, and, and we're conscious that not everybody is is fully aware of what what has been happening. So, in October 2019, abortion was decriminalised um, at Westminster against the will of the people. Um, they changed our laws in Northern Ireland um, unconstitutionally. Um, and, and decriminalized abortion. In March 2020, they had until the, the 31st of March at Westminster to come up with abortion regulations. It was around about the 25th or 26th of March that they actually published them. Um, and at the start of April 2020, Robin Swan, the health minister said, well, I'm not going to commission abortion services because it's too controversial an issue. It's the kind of thing that needs to get, a, get brought to the executive. It goes across a couple of different departments. So he said that under the ministerial code, he wasn't able to do it. Now, commissioning is an important part of the abortion regime because commissioning is how they get their money. Um, it, it pumps money in, it pumps training in, it pumps staffing and facilities into the province in order to allow them to run this service. Now, we saw commissioning documents that said they wanted a service that was scalable to about six and a half thousand abortions per year. They got that number by simply taking the number of live births in Northern Ireland and dividing it by four. Because in England, one in four children are murdered before they are born. So they worked out how many abortions they want to carry out by looking at how many kids are born now and dividing by four. Imagine in a scenario where they would kill a quarter of them. But Robin Swan would not commission, he would not give them funding, he wouldn't do um, any of the things that were required to bring the service fully up and running. But some of the trusts then stepped in 
and said that they were going to provide an abortion service. And since April 2020, we have had an abortion service that has been run by a bunch of rogue doctors and nurses. Um, we reckon there are about 10 to 15 of them. It's not many. They run their clinics on HSE properties um, in all of the trusts at the minute. Um, they have no official funding. So the trusts are having to make money available that they're scraping away from somewhere else. Um, so in the Northern Trust, for example, um, we went to their, their public board meeting um, a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, um, and eventually they admitted to us that they've taken 34,000 pounds of locum resources. So the, the, the money that's used to pay for doctors to come in and cover for other doctors, they've taken 34,000 pounds of that, and they've set it aside to provide abortions between um, the beginning of January and the end of March. They operate one day a week, costing the taxpayer around two and a half thousand pounds per day of murdering children. Um, because there is no official <clears throat> pathway within, within the NHS for abortion in Northern Ireland, the booking system is run by Informing Choices NI. Informing Choices NI were formerly the Family Planning Association and they are pro-abortion activists um, who now um, run a booking system where you phone in the morning, um, you, they take your, your details, they pass those details on to the doctor who's providing the abortions. The abortion doctor gets in touch, the woman goes to the clinic and gets the pill and the average wait time is, a, is between 0.8 and 1.2 days. If you phone in a Monday, you will have your abortion on Tuesday. Interestingly, Informing Choices NI are a charity. Um, <clears throat> they are funded primar primarily by um, the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust, um, who fund what I um, lovingly refer to as Northern Ireland's Axis of Evil. Um, so the, the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust fund Informing Choices NI. They also provide funding for Alliance for Choice, the, the abortion advocacy group, and they provide funding for the Alliance Party as well, um, who are very much um, pro-abortion in their stance. The death toll at the minute, well, these 10 to 15 doctors with no funding, with no official setup, have managed to kill 1,100 children um, in their HSC premises. But one of the things that we that pains us um, and pains our heart is that all of the other pro-life groups fail to report the illegal abortions that are happening and the children who are being murdered by them. You will hear the 1100 figure mentioned by lots of groups, but there have been between three and 500 illegal abortions. One group, Women on Web, um, who post pills from Holland, have sent 297 packs to Northern Ireland since last April. These children have been forgotten about by other pro-life organizations. So the brief, our brief outline of the regulations that were brought last March by the UK government say that up until, to, up until 12 weeks, a woman can, um, can go for an abortion and does not have to provide a reason for that. Up to 24 weeks, they have the catch-all area, um, which is basically a duplication of um, England's abortion provision ground C. 98% um, of abortions um, in England fall into to this category of risk of mental, physical or mental health to the woman. And then there is a, a third category where abortion is, is allowed at any time during um, pregnancy for immediate necessity risk to life of grave permanent injury to physical or mental health of the woman and severe fetal impairment or fatal fetal abnormality. And the, <clears throat> the final group that I've highlighted in blue is the group that Paul Givens' bill is trying to change. So here is the text of the bill in its entirety. Um, Really, the only part that's of any relevance is this um, middle section here. And what it does is it, it removes some wording from the regulations. Now, what I think is really important that you understand here is that these regulations are regulating murder. 
They are regulating murder. And when we're tweaking these regulations, we are playing about with the regulations that regulate murder. So here is what the bill will in effect do. This is ground our regulation seven in the regulations um, in its entirety. And the words that are in blue are the words that will be deleted from the regulations to murder um, should Paul Gibbons' bill be successful. It would remove a severe fetal impairment or from the title. It would remove this, the or at the end of um, paragraph 1a and it would entirely remove paragraph 1b. So it says if the child were born, it would suffer from, a, from such physical or mental impairment as to be seriously disabled. Importantly, it doesn't touch section A. Um, it doesn't touch children who are severely disabled and have a life limiting condition and it leaves them available for abortion up to birth. In fact, one of the advocacy groups who are pushing this bill called Don't Screen Us Out, they have a, a letter um, that they're, an open letter that they're asking people with Down syndrome or family members with Down syndrome to sign that goes to the leaders of the parties in, in Northern Ireland that specifically says this bill will um, protect children with severe fetal um, impairments, but not life limiting conditions. So they specifically point out that you will still be able to kill children who have a life limiting condition. Now, one thing I have to clear up, and, and I don't know if he, is, if he is continuing with this line, I haven't heard him use it since, um, and certainly CARE, who the policy team in London for CARE wrote this, or were involved in the creation of this bill, they have not changed any of their documentation this week. In effect, we told you last week that this would stop abortions for children with Down syndrome or minor disabilities after 24 weeks. Paul Given last Tuesday tried to say that we were spreading misinformation about his bill because he claims <clears throat> that when this bill passes, it would actually ban Down syndrome based abortion back to 12 weeks because you can specifically up to 12 weeks say, I want to kill my child because they have Down syndrome. In this category, you can specifically say, I want to kill my child who has Down syndrome. But he's saying if we, if he removes it from here, it now becomes illegal after 12 weeks. Well, in actual fact, um, the up to 24 weeks is the catch-all area. Um, it allows abortion for pretty much any reason that you want. And even if it did ban abortion on the grounds of, on the grounds of Down syndrome, all somebody would have to do is walk in and say, listen, I would love a child with Down syndrome, but not right now. And they would still get their abortion. Indeed, if you look at um, regulation four, regulation four says that the continuance of the pregnancy would involve risk of injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman, which is greater than if the pregnancy were terminated. And very importantly, paragraph two says that when you're coming to a decision on whether something would affect the mental health of a woman, you can take into account her current circumstances or foreseeable circumstances. So a woman could technically under these regulations still walk in and say, I want an abortion because my child has Down syndrome. And the, the doctor would then have to decide, is this gonna affect her mental health? And if it is, you can have the abortion. In England, everybody gets the abortion under these grounds. Nobody is rejected on these grounds. Um, so, so one of the things that's been happening, <clears throat> just go back to this, one of the things that's been happening, these are, these are what are coming. This is what's coming to us in Northern Ireland. At the minute, they are only able to provide abortions up to 10 weeks. There have been a handful of abortions after 10 weeks. As far as we, are, we know from the freedom of information requests that we have done, there have been no abortions in Northern Ireland carried out after 24 weeks. With a non-commissioned rogue service, they have still managed to kill huge 
numbers of children. And we have been pushing against the door to try to keep it shut. We have been on the backs of the trusts, we've been on the backs of our politicians. We go to these places. We went to the Braid Valley Hospital where they were murdering, murdering children. They murdered 200 children. We stood outside it and we prayed. We asked God to forgive us. We, we repented, we asked him to close it. And that week, God closed it. And in October, the Braid Valley Hospital stopped offering abortions. And they didn't have any abortions in the Northern Trust until the start of January. And we're back now in Jan since January at the, at the clinic in the Northern Trust. <clears throat> so I want to tell you why this bill is such a bad idea. First of all, it will save nobody. It doesn't save a single life. So in 2019, in the abortion statistics, there were 209,519 abortions performed. There were 15 of those abortions, and I put in a mistake there, so that should be after 24 weeks. So there were 15 abortions after 24 weeks for non-life limiting disabilities, like Down syndrome, cleft palate, cleft lip, club foot. There were 15 of them. That represents 0.007% of all abortions. In other words, it's seven in every 100,000 or one abortion in every 14,300. In reality, if Paul Gibbons bill was applied in England, what would have happened is that those 15 children would simply have had their um, appointment moved forward and they would have been killed before 24 weeks. So in reality, we wouldn't have had any after 24 weeks because they would have all been killed before. The bill saves nobody, not a single person. Now at cataclysmic levels, if we were to pretend that commissioning came in fully and the abortion services were fully commissioned and they got their wish that they were able to kill one in every four children in the womb and we pretended that children after 24 weeks with non-life limiting conditions weren't able to get their appointment moved, this bill would potentially in those far-fetched scenarios save one child every two and a half years but the reality is it won't save any and one of the things that you will have seen if you've been reading the coverage of this bill and reading what a lot of pro-life groups are saying is surely if it saves one child that's enough if this does one saves one child that's good frankly no, it isn't. That's rubbish. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 24, 11, to rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. It doesn't say rescue 0.007% of those who are being taken to death. Rescue one in every 15,000. It doesn't say that. It says rescue all of them. Rescue them. But see these people who are saying, if we could save one life, that would be good. Well, what they need to do is get up and go to the clinics and preach the gospel. Because I'm listening to these people say, one life saved would be great. I'm listening to one pro-life leader in Northern Ireland saying, I'm with Oscar Schindler. I want to save one child at a time. I, I think that's good. If we can save one, that's good. The same person told me two weeks ago that they won't go to the abortion clinic. I don't know if he's in the call tonight. Pastor Paul Wright and Let Them Live have, have been going faithfully since the start of this year. The very first day he went to Newry, the clinic in Newry operates on a Monday morning um, until lunchtime. The very first day he went, they, they shared the gospel, they held their signs. A woman drove into the car park. 
she sat and looked at their signs for a couple of minutes and she drove out. When God's people are faithful, God can save more children before lunch on a Monday than this bill will save in two and a half years. You gotta go to the clinic if you wanna save them in ones and twos. But legislatively, legislatively, we've got to save them all. That is the only option. I'll just stop the screen share there. So I want to, I want to lay out the foundation for what God believes about abortion. And if we read our Bible, you can see that God detests, absolutely hates the premeditated premeditated killing of an innocent image bearer. In Genesis chapter four, God comes to Cain and he says, Cain, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground, crying out for justice. After Cain had killed his brother, the result is that Cain is expelled from the presence of God forever. In Exodus chapter 20, 13, God says, thou shall not kill. And it is such a serious offense that he ordains the death penalty for those who take the life of an innocent person. In Proverbs 6, 17, we're told that God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. And throughout the Bible, we can see a particular disdain for those who sacrifice their own children. As God's people, the Bible is very clear what he wants us to do. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, God says to the children of Judah, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. And listen to this part. Seek justice. Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Let me ask you tonight, who is more fatherless than a child who's being carried into an abortion clinic to be sucked through a tube or who's being poisoned to death and being flushed down a toilet? We're to seek justice and correct oppression. Justice and righteousness are themes that run right throughout the Bible. God hates it when we do not seek justice and righteousness. He hates it when we apply as his people unequal weights and measures. In Proverbs 20, verse 23, God says, it says that unequal weights are an abomination, an abomination to the Lord, and false scales are not good. When our laws treat people unequally, when our laws tell us when we can and cannot murder, that is an abomination to our God. And I don't want to dwell on, on this particular bill tonight. Instead, I want to talk about these bills in general. Pro-life bills are a failed experiment in the US and the UK. For 48 years in America, they have been passing pro-life bills. For 50 odd years in the UK, we've been doing the same. The reality is in the UK since 1967, the abortion rate has gone up 300%. We are now living in a society where we're killing in the mainland, one in every four children, 210,000 in 2019, and it will be more this year. It is a failed experiment. And the reason that has failed, it is because it's trying to correct justice and oppression using secular means and secular ideas. And we as Christians and we as our churches have blithely gone along with it, 
it sounds good, it looks good in reality, it does nothing. On Thursday evening, we met with friends in Oklahoma um, and we'll give them a plug. If you want to know about abolition, if you want to know about incrementalism and secularism and providence, check out Free the States. We met with them on Thursday evening in Oklahoma. They have 30, 30 pro-life bills on the books. 30. And the abortion rate's still going up. Still going up. We explained to them what was happening here, and we explained the experience that, that Down syndrome, um, the, about this bill trying to outlaw Down syndrome abortion. And they just went, oh, that doesn't do anything. We've got them here. It doesn't do anything. They just say, I want an abortion for another reason, they get it. It doesn't do anything. And it's really important that we challenge these pro-life bills. We challenge them against the word of God, that we, the, we take the word of God and we say, well, what does God's word say? What does this pro-life bill say? How do they match up? And if they don't match up, we've got to put them in the bin. And in the most simple terms, a pro-life bill, and I know they claim this is trying to protect people, but a pro-life bill says that if you do this, 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 and this, then you can kill your child. If you go and look at a, an ultrasound and you look at the screen, then you can kill your child. If you wait three days, then you can kill your child. If you have to travel a bit further, then you can kill your child. It tells people what they need to do in order to be able to kill their child. Now compare that to what God says. God says, thou shall not kill. A pro-life bill says, if you do this, 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 and this, you can kill. God says, thou shall not kill. They are two completely, completely contrasting things. They discriminate against human beings. They apply unequal measures in our law. If unequal weights are an abomination to our Lord, and pro-life bills that determine when someone can and can't be killed are too. All of these secular pro-life, all these secular pro-life bills do is they tell somebody when, how, and why they can murder their child, and then they go and do it. We could pass a bill in our assembly that would put the only abortion clinic in Northern Ireland at the top of Sleeve Donard and there'd be a queue. There'd be a queue of people climbing it to kill their child. These bills are an abomination to our God. At the end of Romans 1, Paul lists a series of vices and it, among those vices he says, that idolater, idolaters have murder in their hearts. But he also talks about the approval of that. He says, no, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, not only do they do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Pro-life bills that tell you when, where, how and why you can kill your child give approval to murder. They give approval to murder. And when you see our churches supporting a pro-life bill, they are supporting the approval of murder. It grieves my heart to see our church's response to this issue. 
It grieves me greatly. Last month, I wrote to 62 churches who are within one mile of an abortion clinic. I told them where the clinic was. I told them what day it's on. I told them when it's happening. I told them that we're going to go there and we'd love you to come with us and we'll train you. We'll give you all the resources. We'll teach you what to do. We haven't had a single response. Not a single response. There are children being murdered in the shadow of our churches. And our churches are approving of it. This is within our churches. And we, as an organization, we reach out to our churches and we don't want to cause division. But when we have church leaders who are promoting abortion, who are trying to change our laws, who have actively tried to change our laws over years and they're in leadership in our church, something's wrong. When we have somebody in church leadership who is training doctors and nurses to perform abortions, that's wrong. God have mercy on our church. But brothers and sisters, <clears throat> as Christians, we must reject all approval of murder. We must hold up those words, thou shall not kill. We must rescue all of those being led to the slaughter because any attempt to tweak the regulations that allow murder, give approval to it. Abortion must be abolished immediately. No exceptions. The law must apply equally to all human beings because that is what God commands of us. Now, I know that you may think this sounds harsh. <clears throat> and many people have said to me, but listen, these, these laws were, were forced upon us. They're here. And as I said earlier, we have been pushing against this door. We've been trying to keep this door shut, thinking that our pro-life politicians were trying to do it too. It's become clear to us that they have accepted that these laws are here. They have accepted that the regulations are in place. They have accepted that full commissioning is coming and is coming soon. And that will open up the gates of hell massively in this place. Because not only does it involve abortion, it involves our schools and the teaching of abortion in our schools. It involves society, billboards, TV adverts, promoting abortion. It is an, a whole scheme to change the moral fabric of our country and they have accepted that is coming and they have committed themselves to tweaking the regulations that allow murder. And people have said to me during the week, what you're saying is so unfair because these, these regulations have been forced on us and we've just got to try do what we can and you know paul's bringing this bill forward and he's not given his approval to murder it's unfair to say that he doesn't approve of any abortion it doesn't matter what paul thinks it's what the bill says that matters and the bill gives approval to murder i want to contrast what it says in Isaiah verse or Isaiah chapter one with what it says in Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter one, I said, told us as, as God's people, what we're to do to seek justice, to correct oppression, to bring justice to the fatherless. Contrast that to what it says in Isaiah chapter 10 about the people who write laws that do the opposite. Woe to those who decree 
iniquitous decrees. And this is really important. This next line is so important. And the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right so that the widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. In Isaiah chapter one, we're told to correct oppression. In chapter 10, it talks about the people who keep writing it. In Isaiah chapter one, we're told to seek justice. And here it says that these people turn the needy away from justice. We're to bring justice to the fatherless, but the people who write these laws make the fatherless their prey. It isn't just the person who writes the original law who is responsible. It's the people who keep writing injustice who are also playing their part in making the fatherless the prey of this industry. It's really important that you understand that. The proponents of this bill have said many things this week. Firstly, they said it will save lives. It won't, it can't. It says, and this is the part that galls me most, it says it removes discrimination from our abortion laws. And in saying that, they are basically saying that the only part of our abortion laws that are discriminatory are the part that allow you to kill a child after 24 weeks with non-fatal conditions. Paul Gibbon was on, on the news during the week and he said people with um, children with Down syndrome, they tell me that they're offended by our laws because it says that their child is worth more than any, or worth less than anybody else. Well, do you know what? As a human being, I am offended by every single aspect of this law because it says that human beings before 24 weeks and up to birth if they're seriously ill are worth less than me. The discrimin discriminatory part of this law is not the bit about Down syndrome. It's the law itself. That's where the discrimination is because it says that if you are less than this amount of time, if you've spent less than this amount of time on earth, you can be killed. That's where the discrimination comes in. All this bill does is bring in more discrimination. It discriminates by age. It says to a child who has Down syndrome at 23 weeks and six days that you are of no value. But a child with Down syndrome at 24 weeks and one, you are. That's age discrimination. It brings in disability discrimination because in removing um, the, the line for severe fetal, fetal abnormalities, this bill is telling the parents of children with conditions like Edwards syndrome or Petau uh, syndrome or anencephaly that your child is utterly, utterly worthless. That is not the view of my God. It brings in discrimination in the law because it says that if you murder a child who has Down syndrome at 39 weeks and six days, that you have broken regulations. You've broken regulations and you can be punished with a fine up to 5,000 pounds. Whereas if you kill a child one day after birth, it's murder. It is building discrimination on top of other discrimination. Others are saying, and you may see some people using the, on Facebook, they're changing their profile picture to have a, um, a, an image that says equally human. 
equally human. The idea that this bring, bill, bill brings equality is, is false. And if we in Northern Ireland are getting to a stage where we're going to look somebody with Down syndrome in the eye and say, you now have equality because we won't allow people like you to be killed any later than we'll allow anybody else to be killed. We are in a sorry, sorry state. We are one sick puppy. If people with Down syndrome are equally human, children with Edward syndrome are too. Children with life limiting conditions are too. Children who are less than 24 weeks are too. From the moment of conception, we are all human and we are all worthy of the same protection. All human life is valuable and worthy of protection. They've actually said this. They've said this in putting this bill forward. All human life is valuable and worthy of protection. Last Tuesday, when this bill was being proposed, between Belfast and Portadown, there were children being murdered from 9 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. at night. This bill would not have saved a single one of those kids. As we sat patting each other on the back over this wonderful bill, children were dying and none of them are deemed valuable by this bill. None of them are deemed worthy of protection by this bill. And the final thing and big criticism of us has been that this is just the first step. This is the first step in reclaiming our laws. Well, we've already shown that this is a secular step. It's not a godly step. As abolitionists, we uphold godly standards and we said, you shall not kill anybody. We want complete and immediate abolition. But the argument against that is that it's impossible. It's impossible, it can't be done. We're told repeatedly that we have to be realistic about what can be done. And this is a win. This is a win that we can achieve. We can achieve this. Last week, a man, a politician that I have grown up respecting my whole life, sat in the meeting and shouted at me, Mark, if you think you can go to Westminster and win, you're wrong. And in my head, I'm thinking, Moses, I don't have to win. All I have to do is turn up and tell the truth and God will do the rest. We sat in a meeting with pro-life leaders and pro-life politicians and every single one of them were defeatist. But then to my surprise at the end, <clears throat> he said, you know, I'm looking at this bill today and it reminds me of Moses. And I thought, well, where, where's this going now? And he said, this is like the first step out of Egypt towards the promised land. Actually, I agree with him. Because if you actually look at what happens in that story, God delivers the children of Egypt from, um, our children of Israel from Egypt from captivity. He leads them to, through um, the Red Sea, no, not over, through the Red Sea with massive waves side by side as he held back the ocean he leads them through the red sea they see pharaoh and his armies crushed by the sea behind them he takes them to mount sinai where he delivers the law and then they promptly go to the promised land and when they reach the border of the promised land they send spies ahead into the promised land and the spies return and they show samples of the soil. They show how rich it is. This is the land that these people have been promised. But they come back and they say, there are giants in the land. There are massive cities with fortresses that go up to heaven. And the response of the people is to be scared. 
they actually say that their hearts melt in fear. They are so scared of going into the promised land that they actually want to go back to Egypt. They want to return to captivity. And listen to what God says to them. In Deuteronomy 1, verse 29 to 33. Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you. Just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. All the way you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in far by night and in the cloud by day to show you by what way you should go. Despite all that they had experienced, despite being released from captivity, despite being led by a, by a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud, despite being fed in the desert, they didn't trust that God could win this fight. And because of that, they were cursed to walk in the wilderness until God had purged that whole generation of unfaithful men. Until he had purged them all. Until eventually, faithful men rose up and took on those giants to claim the promised land. And you know, this politician, as he said this, it struck a chord with me because that's exactly where we're at now. As Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ came to earth. He was fully man and fully God. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He hung on a cross and died the most brutal death to pay the cost of my freedom. To pay for my freedom. He died the most gruesome death for me. We believe that. We believe that he rose again. He ascended heaven. He is coming back. But yet we don't believe that our God is big enough to take on Westminster. We don't believe that our God is big enough to take on Cedaw. This is a first step. We're taking a first step here. It is the first step into the wilderness. We are stepping into the wilderness with this bill because we have refused to have faith in the God who delivered us. For any of you who come out on the streets with us, one of the things you'll notice is that we have our children with us because we are training our children to take this battle on after we're gone because we need God to purge our generation, to purge our church, to purge our political leaders of unfaithfulness. And this week, as I've asked people, do you think God is big enough and powerful enough to bring an immediate end to abortion in Northern Ireland? As Christians, they say yes. But then they say, but. And a number of times this week I've been told, but I don't think God wants to. I don't think God wants to bring an immediate end to abortion. Let me tell you this. You can blame anyone you want. You can blame the abortion activists for having this in our land. You can blame our politicians. You can blame me. But do not Blame my God. Do not blame my God for this. God is not the author of evil. Man is. God is the author of everything that is good. And when you look through the Bible, 
in order for evil to prevail, it's not the nations that turn from God. It's his own people. Evil prevails when God's people have no faith that he can defeat the giants, that he can tear down the fortresses, that he can win the battle. And what we do instead is we make pro-life bills that try to be pragmatic, that try to negotiate. One of the things that I've heard two different pro-life leaders use this analogy in different, slightly different ways. They, they say the pro-life bills are good because they say we've got a, we've got a, um, a swimming pool with a hundred children in them and, it, and they're all drowning. If I can save two or three of them, I will. Or they say there's a building on fire and there are children in it. If I can save one or two of them, I will. The reality is totally different than that. In effect, what is happening is we have a man with a machine gun coming into a primary school and we are sitting down with him and we are negotiating over who he can and cannot kill. We are saying to him, you can't have these ones, but you can have these ones. We stand outside the gate with the one child we've saved and we ignore the bodies that are stacked up behind us that we've allowed to happen. It is time that we take out the man with the gun. There is hope because the USA is a failed experiment that has taken 48 years of failure. But in 26 states now, there is an abolitionist bill being brought in this legislative session. In 26 states, they are seeking the immediate abolition of abortion. There are men rising up and they are calling their politicians to godly standards. I honestly don't think I've got 48 years. I don't think God will spare me that long. I'm 39 now. I look 50, 60. A man asked me last week, was I retired? I don't think I have another 48 years to go. So what do we want? We want what God wants. We want equal protection for all human beings. We want repentance and revival in this land. We want our church to turn back to God, to call for righteousness and justice, to reject secularism. And we don't have time tonight to go into just how secular the pro-life movement is. But I wanna point out one thing. During the week, I phoned Wesley really angry because CARE had put out a letter in which they claimed we just had difference of opinions. They said there were absolutists. We're not absolutists, we're abolitionists. But they said that we want the same thing as them. They said this. CARE have said that they want to make abortion unthinkable. Unthinkable. Is that biblical? Because the Bible tells me that you cannot make sin unthinkable. I think about sin all the time. I can't make it unthinkable because I am a man. I am a human being. I am a fallen, worthless piece of dirt. And because of that, sin can't be unthinkable. If we could make sin unthinkable, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. We want to bring an end to this. I want to go back to my family. We don't make a penny out of this. We do this all in our own free time. Some of these pro-life industries are raking in enormous amounts of donations. We want an immediate end so that we can go on to the next thing. 
in our lives. And ultimately, and I'm going to, I started with this, I'm going to finish at it. Ultimately, we want to work with Paul Given. And Paul, I don't know if you're watching this. I don't know if you're on this call. I don't know if you're watching this, but I hope you are. This is not about me. It's not about you. It's not about what we think. It's not about what the DUP think or what CARE think. It's about what God thinks. It's about what God says and what God tells us to do. And we want to sit down with you, not as enemies, not as people who have a different opinion. We want to sit down with you as brothers and sisters seeking the will of their father and seeking to do what is right in his eyes, not in ours. So please get in touch, answer our messages. We're trying to reach out to you, show some grace and answer. You know, last week I had a conversation with Tim Martin from CARE last Monday night <clears throat> for about an hour. We sat on the phone. I have rarely met a more gracious, loving man after one hour of a phone call. We talked together. We shared stories with each other. We prayed together on the phone. And I texted him afterwards and I said, Tim, I hope this can be the start of a really long relationship because I got on great with him. As far as I know, and I may not be correct, as far as I know, Tim goes to Bangor Elam. And some of you Sam singers will not be aware of this, but there's a, a worship group formed out of Bangor Elam called Rend Collective. And they have a song called Every Giant Will Fall. And the chorus of that song says, every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past you've broken in two, over fear, over lies, we're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. Let's make that our battle cry. Let's put on our armor, God. Let's get behind the king and take on these giants. And Paul, I want you standing beside me. I want to be standing beside you in this fight, following our king in the battle with the giants of Westminster and Sedaw and delivering the promised land to this country and being a beacon of light to the whole world. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.